Okay. Um, yeah, so welcome to this brown bag. Uh, um, today we've got Lorraine Graves uh, talking about, well, dealing with the media, how to kiss. Um, and I would like to acknowledge that she, uh, Swiss does its work for Canadians from the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Squamish, Salvatooth and Musqueam nations. This acknowledgement is a reminder of the discriminatory, racist and colonial practices that had a lasting legacy and continue to create barriers for Indigenous peoples and communities in our city. In the next few days, I encourage you to learn a bit more about the land we live on and personalise your connection with the territories on which we have settled on. So a little bit about the speaker, Lorraine Graves. Um, she used her university science education and constant dabbling in the media as a student to enter the brand new field of science journalism in the 1980s as a TV news science reporter in Vancouver. Later, she went on to create, produce and host her own series, Breakthrough, that aired on the CBC network. She left paid work to be with a child she didn't think she'd be able to have. Returning to journalism and speaking, uh, public speaking, she has proven daunting and exhilarating adventure. So, yeah, without further ado, on to you, Lorraine. Thank you, Swetha. Good morning. Good afternoon, I guess, by now. A um, couple of bits of business. I'm recovering from COVID-19. So one of the things that's happened is um, there are some cognitive changes and I sometimes use the wrong words. So if what I say doesn't make sense um, or I've said red when I should say green, speak up, please. I don't mind at all. I'd rather it be understandable than, um, than worry about interrupting me. Um, so um, kiss means keep it simple, stupid, but I, I like the way Christine softened it. Keep it simple, silly. And the kiss principle exists in a lot of things. It's probably not new to you. Um, and why should people in STEM deal with the media? Well, the public pays your salary in many, many cases if it's not directly through a government grant. And remembering there's only one level of taxpayer, um, it's through buying your products, your company's products. And the more they know and they, they understand what you do, the, the more they will support you. And also um, people, politicians watch the news, they read social media. And more than just deal with the media, court them. Deal with your um, PR people, absolutely go through communications channels, but um, say, look, I'm doing this and negotiate with your communications people because the more you are known, the more you represent women in STEM. And they say, oh, this is what a woman in STEM looks like. And soon they'll say, this is what a person in STEM looks like. Um, and also another reason to court the media online, offline, newspaper, print, radio, is people will believe what they see in print or on TV or on the internet before they'll believe you. Um, you can put up your publications, you can tweet out as you, you can put on the Facebook as you, but once it's in the media, people will post that and they'll go, oh, okay, see? Um, so, and, and the, the thing that's always surprised me is to nail the veracity of something. People will say, no, no, it's true. I saw it on the BCTV NewsHour it was the six o'clock newscast last Friday. And somehow being able to say when and where they saw it proves how true it is, which I've never quite understood that. So the goals of the media and the goals of scientists and technicians and technologists and engineers and mathematicians and doctors are very different, but they're not mutually exclusive. You can satisfy both sets of goals. Um, the journalist has to please their boss first and foremost. There are enough journalists graduated every year from journalism schools to replace every working journalist in North America. The pressure is incredible to please your boss. And they may tell you what the story is and the angle to take. You've got to go out. And I found that there is nuclear material in smoke detectors. They're dangerous if it's nuclear material. We've got to get a story and warn people. So um, 
you're going to have to deal with it. My favorite John Carroll quote, he was a columnist at, in San Francisco, is we're all made stupid by fear. Don't fight the stupidity, address the fears. So listen for what they're worried about, listen to their fears. And if you ever want to nail something as safe, bring your children into it. I would give it to my child. I have, we have one in my child's bedroom, whatever that they will trust that before they will trust data because everything in the media is about emotions. And when you think about it, we've made all of our big decisions in life based on emotion to get married, to have a baby, to take a job. Um, think about issues like capital punishment and abortion. We'll argue facts, but that's not what we based our decision on. And everything in the media is like that. So the goals of a scientist are very different. A technician, a technologist, a mathematician, an engineer. And I don't think I need to tell you what they are. You probably are well aware of them. So again, they're different, but they're not mutually exclusive, but always keep it simple. It's more important to give the correct impression than super accurate information. And if you have to define a word, don't use it because people will be spending two sentences trying to remember what it meant and they'll have lost those two sentences of what you're saying. So one example of giving the correct impression is I described the um, control group in the new Pfizer vaccine trial. They received, and I said, inert saline injections. Now, inert's not a way that any doctor would ever discuss it. Or you might say harmless saline injections because then they will understand, they've all heard saline because they've watched TV dramas about doctors. But by putting inert or by putting harmless in front of it, they'll understand that this is something that they shouldn't react to. Interestingly enough, in the Pfizer trial, the um, number of people reporting arm soreness or fever or headache for about two days after each injection was just slightly more in the um, vaccine group than it was in the placebo group. So people need people know what they need to know to live their lives, to do their jobs. And it won't be the same as what you need to know to do your job and live your life, but we have to respect each other. I've dealt with scientists who've been very condescending to me when in reality I've studied in their field. So it, it, you have to respect that to be a journalist takes a lot of skill that doesn't show. Just like being a good teacher or a good camera operator or a good farmer, a lot of knowledge and skill is required to do the job well. So mutual respect is a great way to go. I just learned a new phrase, code switching, and it's about language. And it can be if you're an, um, an immigrant or if you're like me, you're from the prairies and you want to talk about siwash sweaters and coyotes and things like that. It's really switching your vocabulary to suit your audience. And I'm constantly doing that. There are about four people in the world I don't have to do it with. My husband's one of them, but they have to know broadcast journalism, television production, some science, some immunology specifically, all these things. And so we, we innately do it, but be aware all the more of doing that when you're dealing with the media. I had a cameraman who's one of the best cameramen I've ever met say to me, what do you mean when you say someone went to graduate school? 15% of our population is listens to CBC radio. That's the top 15% by education and demographics. So 85% of our population doesn't find CBC interesting in the least. So keep that in mind, they're the normals. Just because everywhere we look, our friends are like us. Doesn't mean that's the norm in the world. And we have to understand that it's time to shift out of our comfort zone. And I think women are particularly good at that, at explaining, at understanding and saying, well, if I didn't know anything about this, how do I switch my perspective and practice that? And it also takes time to figure out how to say something simply. It took me seven years 
to come up with a Joe six pack way of saying correlation is not causation. Most people die in a bed. Beds don't cause death. So it takes time to come up with these simple, simple answers. So practice, practice on people. Find someone who doesn't know what you're doing at all, who's not a scientist. The old way 20 years ago, people used to say, talk to your cleaning lady. Now, I don't know who among us can afford a cleaning lady, at least on a regular basis. Um, so find someone that you know. It can be a family member or whatever, but run it past them. What you're going to be looking for is catchphrases. So just as the person you love, you have standard ways of communicating your affection. And it's not phony to say the same thing again. It's what works best and what really has the impact and communicates. Find those kind of things. Short sentences, one verb, straightforward structure, not inverted, active voice. This does that. Present tense. Show your passion. When you're on TV or radio, you almost have to put MSG on your personality, because if you just talk like yourself, you kind of come across like this. So if you're nervous, that's great, because that adrenaline is going to make you more vivid and more passionate. And let your passion show. I'd anatomy could be so fascinating. Or whoever thought that... Um, um, you know, supply side economics could hold such mystery and excitement. Let people know what you find exciting. And also try and find everyday examples of why your work matters. Um, satellites. Well, we've all got cell phones, right? GPS matters. Um, Satellites can be used to, and computers to say, show before and after pictures for a massive mudslide. Did you know mudslides are the natural disaster that kills most people in the world? And they can say, well, there used to be a village there. I guess we'd better get digging. Or they can say, oh, that road's completely inundated, but you can get around this way. So carrying real life examples show the value of your work to taxpayers. Use analogies. They're very, very powerful and they give a whole context in one sentence and they don't have to be perfect. And maybe negotiate them with the journalist. If, if they want to say it, use an analogy, it's not quite right, have another one ready. And remember, it's got to be an analogy that Joe Sixpack would understand. One of the analogies I used is I did a story at UBC Engineering on porous metallics and microgravity. It was an experiment going up um, at that time on the space shuttle. And I said, well, you know, and I stood in the kitchen and I had egg whites with me. And I said, you know about egg whites and how you can whip them up and they still act like egg whites, but you've only had to use a little bit. Well, they're doing that with metal in space and they whip it up. And I had other analogies and so on. And in, for the metal to cure it, all you have to do is um, get it cold again. And you can make great big beams out of it. It's really expensive to have, send heavy stuff into space, but you can do it a little bit. You whip it up and you can make a girder this big out of that much metal. And once it's cold, it's solid. But with the egg white, you bake it. And the better thing with an egg white is you can eat it. So you can bring stuff like that along to your lab, your office, whatever, or you can invite them to interview you in your kitchen. And more boys have played in a kitchen than girls have tinkered with their dads. So kitchen analogies I have found for the most part work the best for most people. Or garden. Another thing is nature and garden. Um, my analogies for the immune system are all about a garden. I don't go for wars and battles. And I say our body's a garden. And when we get a few weeds, no biggie. That's normal to have a few pathogens running around. It's when they take over and all the good stuff is being crowded out. Well, our immune system goes in and at first they just indiscriminately use a hoe to get out what they can. But then it learns how to recognize and pick each of these weeds out. And even after it's gotten rid of the tool that picks those specific ones, the antibodies. 
it still remembers how to recognize them and make that tool so fast your garden's not inundated. And you can use that example for cancer. You can use it for a lot of things. Um, one of the things to remember is as a journalist, what I always did was show a sample of the technical knowledge I had in your field when the reality was that's really all I knew. Most journalists will not tell you when they don't understand. They'll just nod. I was in a meeting with what were supposed to be the 12 top science journalists in Canada. They flew us down to Cornell and a Nobel Prize winner was talking to us. And he says, and when you interpolate and you could see the looks going around. So I put my hand up and said, could you explain interpolate? And he says, well, you know, extrapolate, you use that a lot. Oh yes, well, interpolate's just doing it this way. Okay. So words that seem very obvious to you, if it's more than one syllable, think about it. What's really Im important is to settle for giving the right impression, not being 100% scientifically accurate. And that's very important. Again, like saying um, benign or, or um, simple saline or harmless saline. If you ever find a reporter who's done a good job, either of your story or of another one, get in touch. Send them an email, their addresses are usually available. Send them an email and tell them and CC their boss. Really good reporters are often slower and speed is everything in a newsroom and it's getting to be more and more so. Um, and the other thing is, is if they reply, give them your number, your direct number and say, if anything ever comes up, give me a call and ask them and say, would you like me to call you if anything comes up? Is there a number I can reach you at? Keep that, it's worth gold. Because I know of a case where um, a researcher had been funded to do a report on the contributions and the um, strain on our support systems by immigrants and refugees. And what it came back saying was, they're no strain. Um, it's the Canadian born who overuse welfare or overuse EI, things like that. These are net contributors within a year or two. These are a bargain, we need more. And the government had changed and they didn't support that policy, wouldn't allow it to be publicized. So he called up the reporter he had a contact with and he was on national television, getting his story out his way. And it was very powerful. Learn who to trust. I may not tell you really the story I'm doing. So be wary. You have the opportunity to limit the length of time. You can have code words. Um, you can have someone come in and say, um, John Phillips is calling and he says it's urgent. And you can say, come in after 10 minutes, come in after five, come in after 20. And if I say, no, it's okay, I'll call him back then they know they don't have to rescue you. So have this, um, because the less you say, the more they'll have to use of what you've said. And again, ask what their deadline is. You've got to get back to them in time. And if you're doing a TV interview by Zoom, make a, make a point of looking into the lens because then it feels like you're looking at me when I'm doing your interview. Um, think about the lighting. Mine's not very good right now because the light that's coming from there is cutting off about here, but it's better than it could be. Front lighting women is nice because it hides a few of our wrinkles. And um, make sure your audio works well, do test it. Um, this one I didn't have um, taped down at one point and this is what came through. Um, so listen to it and think about it. Um, and then just think about what you're going to say ahead of time. Practice it even, have catchphrases and think about a good closing phrase. Um, well, and that's why I love science or, and that's why this project matters. You may not get to use it or they may not use it. Normally a shooting ratio is 10 to one. If they're really good, 20 to one is pretty normal. So for every 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, minutes, you 
usually out of a 20 minute interview in science, I could get one or two sentences. The simpler you speak, the more passion you use, having interactive tools and toys helps because they're going to want something to cut away to. So think about this um, and sit still while you're being interviewed. I've seen people on swivel chairs and they squeak and listen to the noise around you. If there's a loud hum, go find it, get rid of it, or go somewhere else. Um, if the kids come in during an interview, I don't worry about that. That's so humanizing. And people see scientists as, ooh, these people that are so distant and so different. So I don't mind if the kids come in. Don't bark at them, because then you'll seem mean. But put them on your lap or do what you need to do. Um, but um, don't freak out if that happens or if the dog comes in. It's a normal part of life, especially during a pandemic. So keep it simple, stupid. You can do it. What you're doing, you care about. Show your passion and um, you should do a great job. Now, does anybody have a phrase they'd like translated? You mentioned Hi. something about a shooting radius or something like that? Shooting ratio. Yeah, there I am using jargon. <laughs> um, you're it's, it's the ratio between how much time you put on tape and how much you actually use. Mm. So unless you're doing something live, you can expect out of a 20 minute interview, one or two sentences will get used. Mm. So don't be disappointed. And if you send out a press release, you have to make the headline really grab people, but they're not gonna use your headline necessarily. And if they do something you don't like with your story, Put it up on Twitter and put your corrections, but write the news director and the reporter and don't be cranky about it. Cranky gets you nowhere. Anybody else have questions? Was this useful? Yes. <laughs> oh, good, good. So can we go around and just in one sentence, tell me what you do and what you love about it? Um, let's start with you. Um, Christine? I work with faculty and um, yeah, I, I really appreciate being able to help them be more student-centered and inclusive and uh, evidence-based. Okay, and think of a way to stay student-centered and evidence-based for people who don't know what that means. Like I, I understand and it's perfectly valid you told me this, but think of another way of, of saying it. So that we show that the students have some control and some power and we make decisions based on the best scientific evidence, not what people think or feel it should be, something like that. Okay, I teach, teach ergonomics and ergonomics is about fitting a workstation, an environment, a job, a product to a person rather than putting the person job or environment, um, uh, putting the person in a job or environment that doesn't fit them very well. And I bet you can come up with a, an everyday example that, that's, that's pretty clear, like a, um, the old-fashioned telephone that you had to use this way and type. Yes. But I'm sure you have better examples than that as well. Yeah. Um, I'm currently teach at the mining engineering program at BCIT, and I love to tell my students about how a closed mine should benefit the local societies as much as an operating one. And I illustrate that by providing a lot of great case studies where that's the case. And you can also say a closed mind doesn't have to be toxic. It can actually become a beautiful place again. Yep. 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 Thanks. That sounds good. Who's next? Sure. I'll go. Hi, Lorraine. Okay. My name is Hi, Nancy, Nancy Bart. And I work at SFU as a student affairs coordinator, which means I help students uh, through their academic journey. And I do this because I love helping students and connecting them to all the different opportunities available. That's wonderful. And do you have an example in a sentence of a problem that came to you that you, a student that came to you with a problem that you solved? Uh, yes, for example, I uh, had an engineering student, a computer engineering student who had trouble finding a co-op work position. 
and I connected him to our co-op manager. And because of it, he was able to obtain uh, a job that starting salary was 100K. Wow. And also when you're doing that, explaining to the press, short get instead of obtain. And um, when you're talking to the media, um, you'd have to explain what a co-op position is and why it matters. But um, Thank that's you. a great job. That's a great job. Who's next? Hi. My name's Hi, Allie. Allie. Hi, Lorraine. Um, I'm a sales and marketing assistant for a biotechnology startup in Vancouver. And what we do is we create 3D bioprinters, which are like 3D printers that print cells um, in the hopes of creating tissue therapeutics. Um, I really enjoy it because it's the future of medicine and it's really cool technology. It is really cool technology. And tissue therapeutics is probably something people wouldn't understand because they know tissue is Kleenex. And therapeutics, well, they know therapy is like physiotherapy. Okay. Um, so it, even more simple than that, because what you're doing is pretty amazing. We're, and is it going to be living tissue? Yep. Okay, so you can say that. We're, we're using a 3D printer like you have with plastic, only we're doing it to make living cells to treat people, to help make them better. And is one easy example, um, skin for grafting? Like you don't have to be doing it, but that's yeah. an example people might understand is we can print skin, living skin for people who've had bad burns. Something like that would really um, be, oh, wow. And even if all you have is something that's been 3D printed and it's, it's you know, a, a, an Eiffel Tower or something, and you, you might have to even explain how 3D printing works. Don't say, do you know how 3D printing works? Because every reporter will say yes, whether they do or not. Okay. <laughs> if you start explaining and they go, oh, I understand, take their word for it at that point. But uh, that's totally cool. Hi, so my name is Tiffany, and this is about something I did in undergrad. So when I was undergrad, I did some work in social linguistics. And what I did was study how different types of language values are represented in media, what stereotypes are associated with them, and how people's attitudes towards these varieties, these different types of speech can change over time, and what go exactly goes into the, exactly factors into these changes. That's fascinating. So it sounds like it's, it's a parallel path to what I do as well then. Trying to look at how you need to change language to communicate effectively in mass media um, is something like what you're doing. So keep doing it. It's, it's important. What do you love about it? Um, well, to be very broad, I love it because it's so interesting. And especially because it's something that really um, affects a lot of people, a lot of groups, and especially minority groups, uh, and how, in a larger sense, this affects people on a personal level because sometimes they're just not confident expressing themselves, but also on a bigger level because then that ties into some issues such as, for instance, uh, race or social economic backgrounds, and so it can be very. Uh, can definitely, it's very complex and it could certainly become a bit complicated as well. So do you have two sentences that you can use a before and an after that show one that uses colored language that enhances prejudice, whereas the other one um, at least negates it if not enhances inclusion? Um. And if you don't wanna to have to think of it on the spot, Go think of something like that um, um, because the media uses very few words because we have very little time or space and they all have to give an impression. And um, that's the other thing is ma making things as succinct as possible. And you can use colored words to give whole impressions, but sometimes those words give the impression that you don't want the public to learn. And so, um, Think about it. And um, one of my best examples of making things small and succinct is the example of, you know how if your cat only wants the, the expensive stuff and the vet says, well, if you only put the cheap stuff out, eventually they're not going to starve. They're, they're going to find it. They will go through it eventually. How do you say that succinctly? A fussy cat will eventually eat. Now to come up with that takes a lot of thinking. 
So do that with what, what you present to the press um, and when you give talks. I am, I run a consultancy practice called Inclusion Advantage. I help organizations and companies identify barriers, uh, systemic barriers that might be in their workplace and create psychologically safe spaces so that um, people can thrive. Okay. And what do you love about it? I love creating a space where our companies, where all potential can, has the opportunity to fully express themselves. And so increase productivity, engagement, innovation, um, while giving everyone equal opportunity. And when you're speaking to media, you're going to have to use even smaller words than engagement. Mm. Um, I think for your market, that works well. But if you're dealing with the public, words that are single syllable and that are warm, and it, because that's what it's about. It's about helping people from other countries get jobs and have a life here in Canada. And there are things that get in the way. So instead of barriers, things that get in the way, we look at those things and we look at ways around them, over them or through them. Is that still accurate? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you. And what do you love about it? Uh, I love creating a country or, you know, creating, like for me, Canada is a very multicultural country. And I love the fact that we can all come together on our shared values rather than, you know, be stay apart because of the color of the skin or the, the way we speak or the, you know, the accent that we bring in or the piece of land we were born on. That's lovely. My name is Jessica. I'm a chief officer for the Canadian Coast Guard. Um, and what I basically kind of, what I love about it is that I'm always on the water. Um, and I do anything from accounting to inspecting cranes um, and buoys, uh, search and rescue and stuff like that. So your job is keeping people safe and when they're not, you rescue them. Yeah, basically. My, my husband, when I met him, was a liveaboard. So we spent a lot of time up coast. So oh, yeah. We really came to appreciate the Coast Guard. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I just wanted to ask, you mentioned about engaging with the media and, you know, gave us all these tips. This is wonderful. How do we actually engage with them? Like, how do we initially contact them? Or how do we figure out who to contact or where to start the process, if you will? There are a few ways to go about it. If you have a media or communications department, brainstorm with them because they will have contacts and also look at what the process for your organization is. Um, um, if, um, if, every, um, if everything is a communications office, be sure to do that. Don't go off on your own. They're often um, journalists who've left journalism because they need a job that pays well. Um, and so they know journalism well. Um, Another thing to do is to watch media, read media, um, follow their Twitter account or um, watch newscasts, listen to newscasts. And if there's someone that's done a particularly good job, go look at some of their other stories, look them up and see how they did. And you can always check them out with someone they've interviewed if it's someone you, you, there's any reason for you to call and see how it went. Cause it might've sounded like a great story, but it turns out they were a total jerk in the situation. Most aren't. Um, and once you've checked them out and you found someone that's good, you can then send them a letter saying, thanks for that story. I really liked it. Um, if you ever need someone with expertise in and give them one or two sentences, very brief, one verb to a sentence, not inverted structure, active voice, this does that. Um, that's catchy, that's interesting. Um, leave it at that, they'll send you a reply. And then you can wait a little while and write them again and just say, actually, we're working on something or we, one of the best things we love getting is we are about to announce. And then it's like, ooh, I got called first. So and the other thing is, 
to ask for advice when a story is done, if they have time, ask for one piece of advice um, because you're paying a compliment. And that's is a thing we do in Canada. Questions are a compliment and to ask advice is to pay a compliment. So does, is that concrete enough? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm just reading all the uh, comments here. They're very kind. So um, I bet when you go home, you'll have questions like, oh, but what about when I've done this workshop at a conference, I hang around because people often come up and chat and the men tend to spend a lot of time saying it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't work that way. <laughs> Women are good. We tend to accept reality and work within it. Um, Lorraine, I do have a question. Uh, wonderful. So SFU uh, recently announced uh, a huge donation from uh, the Ugala family, 34.1 million. This is going to be putting a spotlight on the Faculty of Applied Sciences, my faculty, as well as the BD School of Business. And I'd like to do everything possible to uh, use that money properly, use, you know, like put SFU and Applied Sciences and every faculty in the best light. I'm just one cog in the machine. So, and I don't wanna be stepping on people's toes. I, like, I guess, how can I help without hindering? Um, I'd talk to your media office or whatever they're called and say, how can I help? Or I'd like to help, is there some way I can help? Um, one thing they may not understand because they probably worked at SFU long enough that they've gotten used to the jargon is the public doesn't know what applied sciences means. And they don't know how applied sciences affect our everyday life. And they are the most of all the sciences, they are the ones that affect our daily lives the most. And so getting that word out, having some examples, um, maybe even doing a little series of, of one a week press releases, they can court a TV station, um, they could court an outlet of some sort and say, would you be willing, would you be interested in a feature a week on some aspect of our applied sciences? And they can bring in, because I remember SFU had this amazing way of doing dance notation by computerizing motion, because the old way of doing it was really a very um, slim representation of reality. Um, so you could do things like that. And um, if you're ever approaching the media, a little bit of video shot this way, um, um, a picture with a person and a thing or a place in it shot this way and that way, um, very useful. And a couple of really catchy phrases. Um, going back to the printing tissue, um, 3D printers aren't just for making nifty gifts for mum anymore they're for saving lives you know things like that so it has to be really punchy and catchy um but yeah work with your pr office but go around and find interesting people because the other thing is in any institution the person who wants to be the spokesperson if it's a if it's a hierarchical organization and i'm afraid my prejudice is men's organizations often are and women's tend to be web structure but find the most articulate person. So even if they're fabulous, if their accent's too thick, or if they um, just can't really um, ever maintain um, eye contact and um, say what you um, really want them to say, find a tactful way to say, you are such a great leader. I see how uncomfortable you are. Could we bring along and mentor someone who wants to be able to deal with the press? and they will go on to publicize our field even after they graduate. Something like that. Um, because a good, good spokesperson is worth their weight in gold. Thank you. And you want someone who's excited and vibrant and whatever. So yeah, have a toy to play with. Have something to show them when you're, when you're being interviewed. Not complicated, simple, um, that you can explain in sing single syllable words. But I, I saw that. That's an amazing thing to get. And Applied sciences are, are so easy to publicize. Um, it's the pure sciences. I worked at Triumph in their communications office 
And it was a little harder. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so yeah, if there's no more questions, um, then I just want to thank Lorraine very much. If you all want to switch your videos on and just like give a wave or a jazz hands or a thumbs up to, to thank Lorraine. Well, this is actually sign language for cheering, right? Is that what it is? Ah, I'm, that's I'm, what it is. There's another leadership program that I'm involved in. And yeah, this is, we always like do a bit of like jazz hands as the kind of a thank you or whatever. <laughs> Well, I've been to schools where they have kids with, with um, issues around noise sensitivity and I'm at an assembly and they all go, let's show, show our, let's clap with our, with our, you know, with our hands so it doesn't hurt our ears. And there's all these little people sitting cross-legged on the floor going like this and it's just joyous. Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you very much to Lorraine and thank you all for coming today. Uh, and there will be a survey, uh, I think, emailed to you about this event if you can all fill that in that would be amazing just to give us some feedback and we also have some more events coming up this this for the end of the year um tomorrow i think yet yeah, tomorrow we've got a, a workshop enhancing your professional brand with a social media uh, audit with jen newstead and um, on the 15th, next Wednesday, we've got Finding Your Voice and Meeting Ourselves with Gwen uh, Paulinowski. <laughs> and on the 18th, we've got an Adult Science Trivia Challenge. Oh, those are fun. Yeah.